And now here's Dr. Jenkins. The reason that we're having a discussion on this topic is because we've seen dramatic increases in the price of corn in recent months. And so that's revitalized some of the questions we've had about the profitability of bringing fat energy into the uh, dairy TMR in place for corn energy or other cereal grains. Not a new topic, but one that resurfaces when the price of corn reaches uh, record levels like it has been. Uh, so I know a number of you have been asking questions about evaluating the cost per unit of energy of fat versus corn. And uh, it's not my intentions to provide you cost figures or analysis. You can use your numbers better than I can come up with them. But rather, I want to give you a few energy considerations or thoughts to take into account as you make this assessment. Considerations about the energy value of the fat sources you have to work with and some of their limitations so that hopefully you're going to come out on the positive side profit-wise by using more fat into dairy TMRs. So let me start with the first of several considerations, just a simple question of what is the energy advantage of fat over corn? And a number of people start looking at this from a total energy or gross energy basis. And these are some of the numbers you might come up with. Uh, corn has a value that's just over two megacalories of gross energy per pound. Now that varies with the stage of maturity of the corn kernel. Uh, but the number that I have listed here is typical of corn at 56 pounds per bushel. Now compare that to vegetable oil, and let's say corn oil. Okay? And it's just over four megacalories per pound. So that's a two to one energy advantage of fat over corn. Now that's a little unfair to do it on that basis because it doesn't account for the greater energetic efficiency that that energy has when it's utilized by the animal compared to carbohydrate energy. So it's more appropriate to, do, to take a look at it on a net energy basis. And I'm going to go to NRC for those numbers. It lists corn at 0.84 megacalories per pound versus vegetable oil like corn oil at 2.57 megacalories per pound. And now we're talking more like a 3 to 1 energy advantage. So anytime you come up with fat costs that are three times higher than corn or lower, you're certainly in a position to think about um, carrying out that substitution or bringing more fat in. So like the bottom shows, if you replace one pound of corn with corn oil, let's say with fat, you'll increase net energy 1.73 megacalories, that's enough extra energy to give a potential milk increase of five pounds or even more, maybe even approaching six, depending on what some people have published for net energy values. And you can do the math and see that that will give you a profitable return on your investment. Now I'd like to follow that up with a second consideration. Uh, you're going to have a variety of fat sources to look at and to choose from when you do this. You can't assume that all your fat sources are going to have those energy values, the same energy contents that I talked about. Now, the different fat sources are going to vary in the two parameters I have listed here, fatty acid composition and fatty acid content. And the question is, when you vary these two, how is it going to affect the energy value of your fat source? Now, the fatty acid composition is also called profile. And it's just the blend of the individual fatty acids that make up the fat source. And we usually express each of those individual fatty acids as a percent of the total fatty acid. Let me give a couple examples here. Here's four fat sources that have been used in dairy rations at one time or another and have a very dramatic difference in their fatty acid profiles. I want to show you the two major saturated fatty acids that's often found in fat sources, palmitic and stearic, and the three major unsaturated fatty acids that are found in most fat sources, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acids. Now together, those five fatty acids 
make up the majority of the fatty acids in any of the fats you're going to feed. Probably 95% or more of all the fatty acids will be those five. Okay. And now let's look at how they differ in these four fat sources. Tallow is a good contributor of oleic acid followed by saturated fatty acids because of its animal origin. So it's high in stearic acid typically compared to anything else we see across the table. Now compare that to distiller's grain. Okay? And any corn co-product uh, is based on a corn oil composition and is high in the polyunsaturated fatty acid we call linoleic acid. Now distiller's grain doesn't have much stearic, nor does it have much of the linolenic acid, which is another major polyunsaturated fatty acid. If you want a good source of linolenic acid, look at linseed oil coming from flax, which is nearly 60% linolenic, followed by modest amounts of oleic and linoleic, but very little saturated fatty acids. And the last one to mention is canola oil, a uh, very good contributor, once again, of oleic acid, followed by linoleic, but once again, very low in saturated and low in linolenic. So four fat sources quite diverse in the fatty acid composition. How does this affect their energy values? What numbers would you use? Actually, it affects it very little because all five of those fatty acids have very similar energy contents, somewhere in the range of 9.3 to 9.5 kilocalories per gram. So it doesn't matter how you mix up those five major fatty acids you're going to end up with the energy content that's very similar. And that holds true, too, for the high palmitate supplements that are receiving a good bit of attention now. It, too, has an energy value within that range. Now, unlike composition, fatty acid content has a very big impact on energy value. We express content as the pounds of total fatty acid in the supplement per 100 pounds of the fat source that you're going to use. And the higher the fatty acid content, the higher the energy. So let's look at that has just 10% fatty acid in it to a whole cotton seed that's maybe double that in the 17 to 18% range perhaps to bypass fats that boost fatty acid contents way up there in excess of 80%. Still some variation among the three categories of bypass fat, calcium salts, triglycerides, and those that are high in free fatty acids. But the point is, as we increase fatty acid content among these fat sources, we increase the energy value. And the energy value is tied very tightly to fatty acid content, but not to fatty acid composition. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to raise a third point. Adding fat will always increase ration energy density, but not necessarily provide more energy for milk. So if you can imagine replacing a pound of corn with corn oil and all the fatty acids and all the energy that's there, how could it possibly end up not providing more energy for milk? Well, there's three situations that this might occur. You add the fat to the diet, and the presence of the fat reduces dry matter intake. And it's severe enough to provide um, less energy to the mammary gland than what the corn would provide that we're, we're comparing it to. A second situation is if you add the fat and it reduces rumen carbohydrate digestion. A common problem when feeding too much fat caused by the fat interfering with microbial fermentation in the rumen and lowering energy digestibility. And the last situation would be if the fat itself was poorly digested and provided less digestible energy than the corn grain that we're comparing it to. So I'd like to give an example of this, and I'm going to go back to one of my studies many years ago. Amount of fat, 5% added fat which is these days uh, certainly on the high side of fat supplementation. And the source of fat was yellow grease. That's a, a blend of animal and 
fat and vegetable oil, so it's more on the unsaturated side. So it was a high rate of supplementation of a very high unsaturated fat source, and I measured total tract digestibility. Now, th these are the intakes, dry matter and energy intakes for a control diet in this study uh, with no added fat. And let's look what happens if I would add the yellow grease in an ideal world. The world where it would not affect dry matter intake, nor would it have any effect on rumen function, so energy digestibility remains the same. Now, what happens to the ration energy density? It goes up from 2.04 to 2.16 because we have more fat and more energy per pound. Along with that, we get an increase in gross energy consumed from 103 to 109 and a corresponding increase in DE available from 67 to 71. So that extra megacalories of DE translates into more net energy and more milk and a, a profitable return on investment. Now, what actually happened in this study was that we did get a drop in intake from 50.4 to 45.1 pounds per day. And we did see some signs of it interfering with rumen function and digestibility of energy dropped down to 16.5%. So it's kind of a double-edged sword here, drop in intake, drop in digestibility of energy. What happens to ration energy density when we have these two negative responses? Well, nothing. We still get an increase in digestibility of energy because the fat is still there when you measure the energy content of the diet per pound. But energy consumed went down from 103 to 97.4 megacalories per day and DE went down from 67 to 58.9. So as an example where we added this high energy fat supplement, increased ration energy density, but actually had less energy available for production. Now, um, can we see this on the production side? Indeed, we did see it um, on that side. And uh, what happened was that we got a reduction in intake uh, when we did that. Uh, I mean, a reduction in milk, which dropped down from 70.4 to 69. Uh, production was not high because it was during summer periods. Uh, we got a very appreciable reduction in milk fat content and protein content of the milk, and it all resulted in uh, a drop, a significant drop in the milk solids produced per day, certainly not a situation where we would want to be. So we need to avoid those negative effects if we want to come out ahead on feeding fat and substituting it in for corn, especially when you're looking at going to the higher levels. Now, how do we avoid those negative effects so we know we're going to come out on the positive side? All right, now the bypass fats have provided a convenient way, alternative for us to do that. Uh, because they were spe specifically designed to avoid digestibility problems in rumen. Now, this is data uh, that came out of Ohio State in 2011, and it shows a uh, control diet with no added fat versus one that had 2% commercial bypass fat added. Now, that he actually used three bypass fat sources, but I just averaged the data because the results were similar. And uh, there was no appreciable change in dry matter intake, nor any dramatic change in the digestibility of energy. So there was an increase in gross energy consumed and in the digestible energy density of the diet when the 2% commercial bypass fat was added. Now, the, more, the greater challenge is rumen active fats. And that's the term that I use for fat sources that have the potential to cause digestion problems in the rumen. And this would include tallow, um, distiller's grain, whole cottonseed, bakery waste, or, or sources like that. Okay. How do we avoid negative responses to get a profitable return on our investment? The biggest tool that we have to do this is to choose a proper feeding rate. Right? Because I think uh, 
all fat sources have a level of inclusion in the dairy diet below which you will not get these negative responses and you, and you can get a profitable return on your investment. Now, it, it would be nice if all fat sources were similar enough that we had a, a single feeding rate that applied to all fat sources, but that's not the case. We, <clears throat> the, the proper feeding rate is going to depend not only on the characteristics of the fat source we're using, but also on the characteristics of the ration that we're putting it in. And we need to be flexible and to be able to make adjustments for each individual fat source. Now I have a few fat feeding guidelines that I use to help guide me on how much of these fat sources to use. The first thing I keep in mind is cows have a maximum tolerance to fat. You just can't keep putting it in there at no end and expecting uh, milk production to follow. The data has showed us over the years that eventually when fat in the diet reaches a certain level, uh, production efficiency levels off. Milk production levels off and you have nothing more to show for your investment. So we don't want to go much beyond that level. Now a number of guidelines have been put forth over the years to estimate that level. The, the guideline that I like to use is the one that says that the pounds of total fat intake by dairy cow should equal or not exceed the pounds of milk fat produced. And I use that as a general guideline to be sure that I'm not going too far in my fat feeding program. So let's look at a simple example. Uh, if a we had a herd that was producing 100 pounds of milk per day at 3.5% milk fat, then we would want to limit total fat intake to 3.5 pounds per cow per day. Now this is from all sources, so remember it's coming from the basal ingredients plus any added fat supplements you want to use, which are going to be a combination of bypass fats as well as what I refer to as the rumen active fat supplements. Now don't underestimate the contribution of the basal right, because it's highly variable and also can be much higher than what you think of what many of these nutrition programs have stored in their library. So oftentimes if you do an analysis you'll see much higher. So let's, let's take some numbers here. If cows are eating 50 pounds of dry matter intake per day, and let's say that the basal ingredients were 2% fatty acid, right? just to use some easy numbers here. That's one pound of fatty acids coming from the basal ingredients. Right? And that would then leave two and a half pounds of fatty acids that could come from the supplements. Now, the combination of bypass and rumen active. Now, if you wanted to bring in rumen active sources like distillers, grain, or whole cottonseed, you can't necessarily use all that two and a half pounds up. It may be too much and interfere with rumen function. So you need to limit the rumen active fats. Now, equation that I use to help guide me with how to limit them is one that I developed a number of years ago. Uh, where it can be estimated by four times the NDF content of the diet divided by UFA. UFA is the unsaturated fatty acids in the fat source and it's just the sum of the 18-1 plus the 18-2 plus 18-3, the three major unsaturated fatty acids in the fat source. That number is going to give you the percent of the ration that should come from the specific rumen active fat that you're looking at. So as an example, if I was feeding a diet with 30% NDF and it had a UFA of 80, that would be typical of distiller's grain or many bakery waste. That would come out to 1.5%. So this says no more than 1.5% of the diet should come from this particular rumen active fat source. So again, with the cows eating 50 pounds of feed per day times 0 0.015, uh, that's 0.75 pounds of fatty acids 
coming from this fat source. Now, if it's distiller's grain, that's 10% fatty acid. That'd be seven and a half pounds of distiller's grain, for example, to give uh, 0.7 pounds. I'm sorry, not percent. 0.7 pounds of fatty acids. So, how much is left over? Well, we said we could feed two and a half pounds of added fatty acids. Uh, if we're going to take out the 0.75 pounds of fatty acids coming from distiller's grain, we still have 1.75 pounds that could come from uh, bypass fat supplements or those that have lower unsaturated fatty acids. So that, that I just use that as a way to help guide me, get me in the ballpark for uh, how much of these rumen active fats that I can feed. Now, if I feed a lot more than that, I run the risk of going over the edge, interfering with rumen function, and having milk uh, uh, production problems, uh, milk fat issues, and so forth. Uh, the last consideration I wanted to mention was <clears throat> if you're going to bring fat in in place of corn, um, or other parts of the TMR, watch out for what it does for your other nutrients because the corn supplies uh, other nutrients and that substitution could lower your total protein, uh, lower your supply of fermentable carbohydrate and thus the synthesis of microbial protein. So your nutrition modeling programs should watch your metabolizable protein carefully to make sure that it's being balanced out properly and that might apply to vitamins and minerals as well. So with those thoughts, I hope it provides you a little bit of thought and ammunition to make a decision on the right amount of fat to use and the right way to get a profitable return on your investment. So I thank you for uh, coming in and giving me a few minutes to share my thoughts and, and likewise I thank Virtus for giving me the opportunity to pass along. Uh, those thoughts and at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Renee in case she wants to pass along any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you Dr. Jenkins for those insights on how to evaluate fat and corn in our rations. We're now moving into the question and answer period and as I mentioned before you can certainly ask questions by typing, your, typing them into those box, the box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and then we'll pull those up and, and ask them to Dr. Jenkins. We've got a couple that have come in already. Um, the first one is, would you classify whole cotton seed and other oil seeds as a rumen active fat or a bypass fat? Yeah, it's kind of right on the edge, and we kind of go back and forth on that one. Um, it, certainly, it, it certainly provides some protection by nature of its hard outer seed coat that would be tempting to think of it more as a, a bypass fat that wouldn't interfere with rumen function. But on the other hand, there's a number of forces that occur to disrupt that outer seed coat and expose the internal um, lipids to the microbial enzymes. Um, processing of it, cracking or grinding, certainly would do it. Uh, the animal chewing it uh, would provide further disruption of that seed coat. Um, rumination, rechewing it again, and even softening, I think, by the rumen fermentation process could all add up to um, make that internal uh, lipid content and oil seed pretty available to the microbial population. Um, so I, I, because it's so variable, the, the possible protection is so variable, and I tend to err more on the conservative side. I, I don't give too much credit uh, to protection in that way and um, try to treat it more um, uh, like um, um, a non-bypass fat source, a rumen active fat source um, for that reason. Great, thanks Dr. Jenkins. We've got a, another question that came in. With added fat, all sources I try to get calcium over 1%. What would you suggest for, for magnesium? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a recommendation that goes back to um, uh, when that was vigorously being evaluated and studied for drops in mineral digestibility with higher amounts of fat and the natural reaction 
to make calcium and magnesium salts uh, that occur in the rumen. Um, I, I think it, it, it is a good idea, and it's one that I follow myself, is to go a bit beyond NRC recommendations on it. Um, I think the, we're a little bit unsure about exactly how the reaction of fatty acids with magnesium are, and, we, and we've had more data with calcium, and that's allowed us to give more specific recommendations on up in calcium to over 1%, which I think is a good recommendation. So, I, you know, I think it doesn't hurt at all to go a bit higher on magnesium above and beyond what NRC goes, and maybe, you know, 20 or 30% higher or something short of having more real numbers to show what, uh, what happens to the magnesium status. But it's probably safe and a good idea to go a bit beyond NRC. Great. The next question, Dr. Jenkins, is what level of rumen unsaturated fat do you try to stay below on a percent basis? Yeah, OK. Yeah, and, and uh, somebody's, again, you know, wants to pull us back to having uh, one number that fits all fat sources. And if you have to have one number, then I think it's wise to be very, very conservative and to choose a number that, that is going to apply to your worst fat source, something like a vegetable oil, which means that you're going to need to keep total, ration, or total fat content in the ration uh, perhaps below 6%. 6-7%, um, which is very conservative, which means when you have other fat sources come along that's not as unsaturated or rumen active as oil seeds may be or, or some of your bakery products, uh, you might be able to feed more, but, but you're limiting yourself with a single um, number. But I think if you're looking for a single number, uh, you have to err on the conservative side and treat it all like it was... Um, uh, corn oil or soybean oil or something to be on the safe side. Great. Our, our next question is, is the unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acid the total number of C18-1, C18-2, C18-3 in the diet already, or is it the product you are considering adding to the diet? Uh, yeah, the the amount that's in the diet already figures into that total maximum fat feeding part of it. Uh, but the four times NDF divided by UFA, that UFA applies only to that one particular fat source. That you're trying to evaluate how much to feed. So you have to have some information on the fatty acid composition of that fat source. Right? Now, where are you going to get that? Well, many nutrition uh, models now um, have that built into their library, so you can get an estimate that way. Uh, but if it's um, you know something like a, a waste product or something, um, it, it's certainly well worth the money invested to have it analyzed to see what that composition is, and then you can add the 18.1, 18.2, and 18.3 values that come back to the lab and use those. Uh, for that particular ingredient in that equation to try to set a mark for what is the upper limit of that that I, that I should be feeding. We've got a, a question that follows right along with that, Dr. Jenkins. You, know, you mentioned models. What is the status of fat submodels, and will this help dramatically with formulations? Okay, yeah. Well, I'm certainly not uh, the best person uh, to ask uh, about the status of the modeling program because um, I'm confused and in the dark myself most of the time what's happening with them. Uh, but I know there is progress being made, um, uh, and there's more and more effort being made to um, bring in lipid models. Many of them are private models within companies and not yet shared publicly, but there are a few public models uh, that are working very, very hard to update and bring up their prediction equations. And um, I think, you know, uh, the ones that are commercially available now to the public uh, are at a very good place. They're at very good room for improvement, but I use those myself. Their libraries are generally good to tell me, you know, uh, what's happening with the fatty acid composition of the ingredients, and to 
uh, provide information about um, what are the basal levels of these of those fatty acids in the diet. So I think they're very much of a help um, combined with the fact that we have several labs that are analyzing that now, and you can enter your own data in there. But we still have some gaps in our knowledge about rates of lipolysis and biohydrogenation and digestibility in the animal to, for room for improvement on these. And they're working on those all the time, so uh, that's a work in progress. And, and uh, I'm like whoever asked the question, I think I have the same question myself. Uh, when is the next bigger and better version coming out? And I'm trying to stay on top of that myself. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Well, it looks like we're right out of time and we're out of questions as well, so that will work. It's uh, time to wrap up this hot topic webinar on fat versus corn. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. And as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is recorded, and so we'll have this up on VertusNutrition.com by Monday at the latest. Also, if you're technically inclined, please mark your calendars for our next segment of the Fatty Acid Forum entitled Fat Feeding Strategies to Maximize Returns that is scheduled for Thursday, November 15th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Thanks again for being part of the Fatty Acid Forum sponsored by Virtus Nutrition.